welcome once more to our online service uh, and this is the online service from the linked parishes of St Michael's Dallas, Rafford Parish Church and St Leonard's Church in Forest. A warm welcome to everybody who's joining in. We start our worship with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, let us start uh, with uh, praise and a wonderful hymn is often used at evangelical rallies and it reminds us of how God is always faithful to us even though we are not always faithful to God God is always faithful to us hymn 153 in the church hymnary great is thy faithfulness Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace, we see the damage inflicted on the world around us and the resulting harm to our siblings in climate vulnerable places. And we mourn. We lament our 
selfishness and greed. We lament the broken relationship between humanity and the rest of creation, all God's creatures. Teach us the humility of the younger son, uh, the prodigal, so that we can be honest with ourselves and with one another about our failure to care for the planet in the ways that we are called to do. In the silence, now we call to mind those times when we, not just as individuals but as a society, have failed to tread lightly on your earth, in your garden of creation. And we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of forgiveness, who just as the Hebrew father welcomed the lost prodigal child home with loving open arms wants to restore our relationship with one another and with the earth. Even as we acknowledge our role in the overuse of resources and a failure to live sustainably, may we not be burdened by guilt and shame. Instead, free us up to work for climate justice and to hope for a better future for all people on this earth. Lord, as poverty grows rapidly around the world and the global economy is rapidly failing the most poor, direct the leaders of the nations, especially the superpowers, to turn from warfare and competition to peace to build and legislate for new structures of economic justice so that poverty and want are eradicated. God of grace, we thank you that we have enough daily food to place on our tables. Help us to share in the abundance we enjoy. Share with those in the greatest need. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us now turn to Scripture for our guidance and inspiration. Let us uh, read, first of all, from the Old Testament, from the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 5, reading from verse 9 to verse 12. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reports of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. And there was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Well, thanks be to God. That's a story of when the, the uh, Israelites had crossed into the Promised Land, led not by Moses, but God ordained, led by Joshua. And the manna stopped just after the God started to provide daily bread for them daily bread in the form now of grain grown by the Canaanites, an agrarian society, and the Israelites from then on slowly moved in to take over the Promised Land. But it's significant that 
on that day, a God-appointed day, the manna stopped and they were able to eat the grain and bread of <laughs> the land. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Now let us turn to the New Testament and we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we read first verses 1 to 3, and then verses 11 to 32, as laid down by the lectionary for this coming Sunday. <clears throat> Luke 15 and 1. Now the tax collectors and Pharisees were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Reading from verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard much music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. 
the elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with harlots, prostitutes, comes home and you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, what are we to make of this parable? The verse I've chosen as a key verse is this. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered about Jesus. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus told them this parable. It is not God's nature to reject his children. Nor does God shut the door to the sinner who repents. So how did Jesus convey this message to his followers and to us today? He did so in parable teachings. The situation or context of today's story is simple. The Pharisees once again begin to criticise Jesus. Their beef with Jesus was that he is a rabbi, a teacher of the Jewish law, and here is Jesus associating with and even helping sinners. There are still people around today who behave in the same way. Ministers are often seen associating with social outcasts or known sinners receive the same reputation as Jesus. But none of us is qualified to judge. God alone is the judge. Jesus responded to their character assassination with kindness. He gently put them right with a story. And that story has several titles. The best known is the prodigal son. Another title is the lost son. Another, the welcoming father. And another, the shepherd's joy. I like that title. A shepherd who is used to rescuing lost sheep almost daily. How much more does he want to rescue his own lost child? Well, Luke chapter 15 contains three of Jesus' stories about something lost being redeemed and returned to God. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. On none of these occasions is the lost written off or rejected. For the lost son, Professor William Barclay used the title the Loving Father. That title changes the focus of the story from the sinner to the Redeemer and we get a glimpse of the true nature of God. The question I must ask you today is where do you stand in this story? With whom do you identify in life when you encounter an obvious sinner, a lost person? 
lost to the church, lost to society, but possibly not lost to God. Yes? Are you like the Pharisees, accusing Jesus, or a fellow Christian, for befriending and even helping sinners? Or are you like the brother who feels justifiably aggrieved? This wayward person has caused so much chaos and family disruption by taking a selfish route that he does not deserve to come home. Is that where you are in life? Full of righteous indignation? Closing the door to redemption or a second chance? There was a story told by my old theology professor. He had the good news about a man who had done well in Glasgow. He had moved from uh, his small community and done well and was a regular church attender and was doing well in the church. And in spite of a slightly rocky start in youth he made good and he joined the church in middle age and it, an indignant response came from a minister's wife oh Lachlan wasn't he always a bad boy at the school it's as if a door had closed on the lad's whole life a bad boy at school would always be a bad boy Thank goodness he got out of that community. How many young men over the years in those narrow-minded Calvinistic communities were doomed to a life of societal rejection, no hope of being welcomed into courtship with someone's daughter, often driven to drink or addictive dependency. How unthinkably cruel and judgmental can be the response of the favoured brother. Perhaps it is good for all of us to imagine ourselves in the desperate shoes of the lost son. The lost child feels such low self-esteem. Everything she or he does in life turns out to be inappropriate and a failure. Have you ever felt that way? Or felt you were unworthy to return home or even to enter a church? Try to imagine the hostile stares and whispering echoes as you try to hear the message of salvation in church. And outside, the world and the devil are getting their cut out of you with a total loss of dignity. I know people who are living respectable lives today, but who dread someone coming into the village from their rebellious youthful days. Focus now on the true nature of God, not so much a wrathful judge as a loving father. And what does the father do in this story of Jesus? Does he grudgingly forgive and say, there's your old room, fit in it? No, quite the opposite. He has been hoping and willing for his lost child to return. And listen to this. While he was still afar off. That means the father is ever actively looking for the lost child to return and even before the repentant sinner has returned to God the father rushes out to embrace them and bring them home and celebrate it is all positive no toxic guilt trip no room for groveling indignity no repayment required just God's open arms and the Father's unconditional love for his child. 
Let us stop here and see the truth so far in this parable. It should never have been called the parable of the prodigal son, for the son is not the hero. It should be called the parable of the loving father, for it tells us rather about the father's love than the son's sin. It tells us much about the forgiveness of God. The father must have been waiting and watching for the son to come home, for he saw him a long way off. And when he came, he forgave him with no recriminations. There is a way of forgiving when forgiveness is conferred as a favour. It's even worse when someone is forgiven but always by hints and by word and by threat his sin is held over him. Often in the highlands a prodigal daughter would return from the city and even into older age she was always reminded of her days of fear stravaging in the city. God's forgiveness is complete. There is no need to revisit past mistakes. The elder brother was actually sorry that his brother had come home. He stands for the self-righteous Pharisees who would rather see a sinner destroyed than saved. Certain things stand out about him. Firstly, his attitude shows that his years of obedience to his father had been years of grim duty, grudging duty, and not of loving service. The second point, his attitude is one of utter lack of sympathy. He's no sympathy for his lost brother. He refers to the prodigal not as my brother, but as your son. He was the kind of self-righteous character who would cheerfully have kicked a man further into the gutter when he was already down. And the third point, he had a particularly nasty mind. There's no mention of prostitutes until he mentions them. He no doubt suspected his brother of the sins he himself would have liked to commit. The heart of Jesus' story is this. God can forgive when men often refuse to forgive. In the face of that saving, redeeming love, we cannot be other than lost in wonder, love and praise. And for most of us, all of us, eternally grateful. Thanks be to God. Well the focus of our story was about the Father's love and a house built with the love of God is a house that will stand. So our church should be a house that's full of the Father's love and welcome. And we celebrate this in our next hymn, 198 in the church hymnary. Let us build a house where love can dwell.
Now let us turn to the Lord in prayer again, but this time as we pray for others, our intercessions, let us pray. Lord, at times we all feel lost. Believing and trusting in you helps us to become found. Hear our prayers that we bring before you. At this time of crisis and welfare and warfare, we ask that all Christians urgently intercede for peace before the Prince of Peace and to demonstrate closeness to those affected by the conflict in Ukraine. The United Nations says that three and a half million people have left Ukraine as refugees. We pray for all refugees that they will receive social welfare, food, water, safety, access to housing, medical treatment and schooling for children. At home, the leap in the cost of living has put increasing pressure on households across the United Kingdom. We pray that those worried about making ends meet and struggling with financial debt will receive the support and help they need. We pray for those living with ill health, with long NHS hospital waiting lists. May they receive the treatment they require to live happier and healthier days ahead. We pray for all those who are recently bereaved. May the Holy Spirit comfort them in their time of sorrow and soothe their aching hearts. On this Mothering Sunday, we give thanks for all mothers for their never-ending care and compassion and for showing us the true meaning of unconditional love and forgiveness. We pray for Elizabeth, our anointed Queen, who has led us well in the ways of Christian faith and peace. May she enjoy time with her family and be supported by loyal officers. As we travel through Lent, we pray for a deeper, more meaningful faith life. Let us seek to instil the fruits of the Holy Spirit into all we say and do. Loving Lord, you are the light of the world. Help us to light the way for those needing your guidance and eternal love. So now, in the words that Jesus taught us, we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Well, our last hymn today is 549. Again, a reminder of the Father's love in our story, how deep the Father's love for us.
let us ask for God's blessing. Let us ask for God's blessing on our lives as we continue on our way. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us all. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to being with you again very soon.